Okay, I have to go through this discussion a little bit quickly. But what we're saying is that if you take an object, let's say like this, a region, R, and you rotate it around a line, which I've been calling K, so it could be Y equals K or it could be X equals K. In my formulas over there, anytime you see a K, it means line. When you do this rotation, you don't just get a volume, uh, you get a surface area as well. And that's what we want to talk about. So we know kind of how to draw this now. We draw a reflection over the K line. Then we kind of draw some arcs to give it a little bit of an artistic you know, look. So we, well, that was pretty bad. But you get the point. I hope you get the point. All right, so we know then that this object has a surface area, and I wanted to talk about that for a second. So this particular one would have to be, you'd have to find the surface area using geometry and also um, calculus. And here's why. If you were painting this, spray painting this from the outside, you would be painting this very obscure shape that nobody knows the name of. But if you were inside the object spray painting, you would just be spray painting the inside of a cylinder, which everybody knows how to find this surface area inside of a cylinder. Okay, so I would use, if I were you, I would just use the old geometry to get the surface area of the inside. I think that thing unfolds into a rectangle number, 2 pi r h or whatever. And then the outside, though, that's calculus. Like, there is no shortcuts on that. It's calculus. Okay, so that'd be like a mix. Some of each. Um, how about this one here? Let's say you had a little more interesting region R. How about your region R looks like this? And you spin it around the line. When you spin it around the line, you're going to again have some interesting features. So this is almost imperative that you visualize. Like, I'm not sure you have, some problems you can just kind of not visualize and still do the problem. But it's really hard on this area problem to do that. You have to kind of visualize it. Otherwise, you won't capture the full effect of what the area represents. So this is where software can really, really shine here. OK. So you don't have to draw what I'm drawing. You're just trying to convince you. This one's a mix also of geometry and also calculus. If you're on the outside of this painting, you're going to be painting this surface, which is, again, one of those weird shapes no one knows the name of. But if you're on the inside painting, spray painting, you'd be spray painting the lateral surface of a cylinder. And then there's this thing, which looks like the collar around my dog's neck. My dog's wearing this thing around his neck. You guys know what I'm talking about? Those cones, right? Yeah. Well, it's not really a cone. It's a frustrum. It always frustrates me when they give it the wrong name. It's not a cone. I mean, you can't put a cone on a dog's head unless you put it on the dog's head like this. But they want me to put it on like this with his little face sticking out. It's not a cone. They obviously cut it off here. It's a frustrum. Get your geometry words right. And I'll learn to draw when you get your geometry words right. OK? OK. So anyway, uh, when you chop off part of a cone, it's called a frustrum or a truncated cone. All right, anyway, uh, that's what this third bit is about. See this part here? But you could use a geometry formula to figure out how much paint you need to paint the frustrum. Geometry formula to figure out how much you need to paint the pink cylinder level area. But calculus to find the outer surface. There's no doubt about that. And of course, it could be that the inside is also curvy, and you need calculus on the inside and outside. And remember, any geometry formulas you forget, you could use calculus anyway. <coughs> so calculus is the tool, right? It gets us past the question. So now, what do we do to find such weird shaped areas? And so I promised that we would start with a sphere, chop it in half. We already know the, the surface area, OK? But let's take a, a ball and we'll chop it right in half. And um, I think we already know this is just a circle. So there's your you know, geometry. 
That's just a circle, no big deal. Write that in green. Except it's completely illegible. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, pi r squared. I'm not going to do a calculus for that. That's the bottom of the circle. Remember, that area was not originally exposed until I chopped. Once I chopped, there's a bottom to it, and therefore that needs to be counted. So anyway, I suppose the area is additive, right? I mean, if you paint the bottom, then you're going to add on however much more paint you need to do the rest. So area is a very additive thing unless things are overlapping. So I already know the answer contains pi r squared plus something. And now the question is, how do we get this goldish area on the top? Like, how, how do we do that? Well, we already know the answer because we've memorized it, but we've never really proven it anyway. Turns out, if this were a full ball, it would be 4 pi r squared, that gold part. But it's a half ball, so it's 2 pi r squared. So there's another 2 pi r squared coming our way, and we already know that. But why? Or how do we do that in a more complicated problem? What if this wasn't a sphere? So we're going to take the sphere as an example. We already know we're going to get 3 pi squared in the end, but let's talk about how to slice and dice up this area. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the surface here and we're going to draw on it one band like this. One band. And we're going to imagine collecting, whoops, we're going to imagine collecting sample bands. Sample. Bands. Now, band is not the same as a disc or a cookie or a penny or a washer. It's also round like those things, but it is completely hollow. It's just a sticker on the outside. You know what I mean? So it's literally just a sheet going around. And if we can write down the differential area of such a strip, if we could, We'd be in good shape because we can do a sigma and collect them, right? And then we could run a limit and it goes to infinity and turn it into an integral, and we'd be good to go. Somehow, I'm sure that the equation of circles can pop up eventually, right? Because the this radii of these bands is determined solely by the equation of a circle, right? Okay, so here comes the question. What is the area of one gold band? And that is very hard to answer. Actually, very hard answer. Is it worth our time? Yes. Because even if this weren't a sphere, even if this was some goofy thing like this, right? That thing's weird. It's a sphere with a propeller hat. Okay. Even if this were the shape, I would still use bands. So in the world of area, we've used rectangle. In the world of volume, we've used basically slabs and now we're talking about what do we want to use as a convention when slicing up surfaces and that's not the only way to do it but bands is a very common way people do it and I think it could pretty much be applied to most situations if not all right okay so back to the sphere let's take a closer look at one band Okay, this is very difficult to find the surface area of. So if you don't mind, I'm going to do what I've always done. I'm going to straighten out the edges. We've had trouble before with curved edges. What if we just kind of straighten this out like that? And I'll, I'll do some color coding here. Purple will be my straight edges. OK, this might make it a little bit easier for us. And although the gold thing is not really a frustrum, the pink or the whatever the uh, red, blue, purple thing is a true frustrum. And the formulas for the frustrum have been known since the beginnings of math history. Like, you can go back and you can find a clay cuneiform tablet from Babylon. And there on the tablet is the volume of a frustrum. 
And I have no idea how they did it way back then. Before Greece, before Egypt, way old stuff. They didn't have the surface area, but they had the volume. I don't think they had the surface area. <coughs> okay? Pretty interesting. And it, I don't know if there's a derivation on that tablet, but it, the formula's there. And they didn't write it in formulas, they used words to describe. Okay? So anyway, the, the surface area of this is notoriously challenging to find, and uh, I encourage you sometime to try it. Um, the easiest thing to do is to superimpose some axes and treat this as a trapezoid. Uh, but even then, it's difficult because it's rounded, and as soon as you flatten it, you get the wrong answer. So you can at least get some perspective on dimensionality if you draw it in 2D, but it's a 3D thing, right? Um, another way to look at this thing, I'm just going off the cuff here a little bit, is to pretend you have a cone and you could look up the geometry formula. It's pi r l. It's the area around here. Maybe you remember that from Mr. Sherman or Mrs. Ringler's class or whoever you took it with. Um, that area is called pi r l. And then what we're doing is we're slicing off the top, see, like this. And the top has, you know, pi r L lateral surface. So I suppose the bottom band that survives this, which is this part only, would be pi RL minus pi RL, which is true, but we, we really um, have difficult time coming up with the formula that the geometry book has, even still, because the formula of the geometry book doesn't have a minus in it. It has a plus. It's really challenging. Proof. But anyway, if you want to try it sometime, see if you can figure out what this yellow area is and try to write it the way a geometry book would, using a plus sign, not a minus. It's very challenging. Okay, so let's go back to this. What have mathematicians discovered about this frustrum surface area? They have discovered that it's basically, it basically works like this. Do you guys remember on a trapezoid when you find the area, right? You take base 1 and base 2 and height. Isn't that true? And so, do you guys remember the area of a trapezoid? I think you probably do. It turns out to be 1 half what? Uh, yeah, 1 half times height times base 1 plus base 2. Right. Okay, there's another way to look at this, though. Think of it as you have an average of the two bases times the height. So, this is a really cool way to look at the trapezoid. You say, okay, look, I'm not going to use base 1, and I'm not going to use base 2. I'm going to use their average, and then I'll times by height. So if you put all of this half, we put this halfer in here like this, what you're saying is it's just base times height. Well, which base? There's two of them. Neither. Neither. The average base. In other words, it's this mid-segment here. This right here is not B1, it is not B2, it is the average of the two. And so now if I construct a rectangle using this green as my width, <coughs> it gives me the same area as the trapezoid had. You see? Very clever, right? <coughs> and it's very easy to prove. That, that one's easy to prove. So the area of that green box is the same as the area of the trapezoid, but you're just going to the middle and you're finding the, the, that this is, and you're pretending that's the base of the rectangle. So you're ignoring the fact that you have two different bases. You're just finding that mid-value base times by the height done. Okay, so we can apply that same logic on the frustrum. Um, if we want to find the surface area of this, right, we would say something like, the radius of the blue thing doesn't matter. And the radius of the red thing doesn't matter. I'll use little r and big r because one's a little bit than the other. What matters is the average between them, which happens to correspond to this radius. r plus r over 2. Okay, you guys with me? So what just happened is the, the frustrum just straightened out. Remember the rectangle on the trapezoid? The, uh, 
Too many pages. Remember what, what I did when I went to the middle, the edges that were tilted whoop, bent straight up. The same thing would happen to the frust drum, even though it's a round object. If I start thinking about this green, this frust drum becomes a cylinder. It's the same exact logic as the trapezoidal case. So whatever the area is of that frust drum, I'm not I haven't curved the edges yet, guys. I haven't curved the edges yet. But see those purple edges form a frust drum. Whatever the paint is required to go around the outside of that is the same amount of paint as if I just did straight up and down version cylinder. But I wouldn't use big R as the radius of the cylinder, and I wouldn't use little r. I wouldn't use red or blue. I would use the green. It's very hard to do well in this class if you don't pay attention. I'm saying that the surface around that strange shape you see at mini golf course, the cone that goes around your dog's head, that area of plastic is the same as a cylinder if we straighten the edges, and if we do it at the exact midpoint of the purple segments. If you find the midpoint of these purple segments, and then straighten it up, same area. Oh, OK, great. So we've got, first we started with this rounded object frust drum. We straightened out the edges. Now we've tilted them straight up and down. Now we're talking cylinders. We're good to go. We're good to go. I'm going to find the area of the green cylinder which will be exactly the same as the area of the purple slash red slash blue frustrum. And then I will say that that's pretty close to the area of a band. Pretty close. Remember, the band itself has curved edges. <laughs> so that's another thing. But right now, we're not worried about that. OK, so here we go. What is the, now we have our cylinder. And this radius is little r plus big R over 2. <coughs> we got this now. What's the area of this sheath? Remember, it unfolds into a rectangle. The frust drum doesn't, but the rectangle would. OK. And let's just, for, for the sake of things, say that this is uh, this height is, uh, we'll just call it for now, uh, maybe H. Obviously, that H just shows up here, right? No big deal. The distance around the top here, we would call circumference. But of course, it shows up at, in the rectangle as length, naturally. OK, so this is kind of weird, but we have to do you know, 2 pi r, we have to do 2 pi r to get that top edge of that rectangle. We don't have a choice. And our radius is kind of weird. Our radius is the average radius of little r and big r. So it's going to be kind of strange, but it's going to be 2 pi r. And now we got the area of the green. It's length times width. It's length. times width, the twos cancel, and this is the area of the green cylinder, which is 100% equal to the area of the tilty frustrum, 100% same. OK, <clears throat> where this was little r, this is big R, because this was r plus r over 2 radius, right? And now we are going to say that from now on, this expression is close enough to the area of one band. OK, so going on, or going back, I should say, to our curvy object, 
whatever this strange area is, it is similar, very close, to pi r plus r h, where little r and big R are defined in the following way. Little r is the distance from the axis of rotation We're just going to call it k. It might be y equals 4, or it might be x equals 4. It doesn't matter which way it's tilted. It's just it's some number. Unto the function, right? So it's this distance. And bigger r is defined axis of rotation to the function at the other end of the interval. Okay, now, that is the correct approximation. What happens when we write out the sigma for these things? Because we're going to start collecting bands now, right? That's the whole point. That's the whole point. So we take our um, first step by doing a sigma. We're going to put that little, what was it again? I think it was um, pi r plus r h. That's what we have, right? We're going to collect these. And unfortunately, there's a lot of k's going on. So if you don't mind, I'll just put one big fat k here. It just means each of the frustrums has its own like size. It has its own little r, it has its own big r, it has its own h. The one thing that I would like to have is a common H. <laughs> As we stack the bands, I'd like each H to be the same, if you don't mind. You guys cool with that? Like, I don't want all the bands to have different heights. I want them to be the same height, uniform, all the way up. So I will pull the H out to here. I will pull the H out so it doesn't get subscripted. Like that. And I'll say that K is some number between 1 and n. So now I have n bands. I'm adding up all their areas. They all have the same height, so I left the h separate. And now I have to decide, do I want to put the limit in now, or do I want to think about this a little bit more? And the answer is, I have to think about this a little bit more. Because this right here, you might have been kind of ignoring it so far, but that guy is the trick. I had a lot of trouble understanding surface area when I was younger. Because I didn't realize h mattered this much. We already know what these are. These are like function, you know, small distance to the axis of symmetry, large distance to the axis of symmetry. But that guy is the length function from yesterday. So this guy is that square root 1 plus dy dx squared dx. Or you can use square root of 1 plus dx dy squared dy. And that's just the H part, you see. It's the H part. Okay, now I'll run the limit. And I was supposed to use deltas until after the limit. Sorry, guys. I was supposed to use deltas. So these should be deltas. Then you run the limit, and they turn into Ds. Anyway, what happens to these two things when you make the limit? So you can stay tuned for the video. Um, Okay, so it's after class. I, I think I'll go ahead and um, fix right here. I was just saying that these should be delta y k over delta x squared. And this should, for now, be a delta x. Or we could use the version where this is delta x over delta y k squared. And then this is a delta y k out here. But anyway, it's the same things we were talking about yesterday. And so why is the h there even equal to these things? Why is that? Well, if you think about it, um, the H has been sort of innocent in this picture, and it's been innocent in uh, this picture, right? But it's not a very interesting, it's not a very uh, innocent feature of this band. It's a curvy distance, you see. So that little distance right there is not a dx, it's not a dy, it's not a hypotenuse, it's a ds. It's one of those curvy travel distances that we saw in lesson 7-4. So going back, when we see h, we know better than to think, you know, d, delta y. It's really this number times delta y. Or if you're 
this is for the case where the bands are like this. Uh, and this is more like the part we're doing where the bands are like this, see? Okay, so you might think, oh, it's just delta y tall, but you have to travel in a curved manner between the bottom and the top of the ring. So that's what this factor is for. Okay, so anyway, let's keep writing. We're almost done. I've just run the limit. All the uh, deltas become d's. And something else interesting happens. See this r and this r? What's going to happen when we collapse our frustrum? Well, the, the little r and the big r are going to both collapse together. That's what's going to happen. So in other words, they're both going to become the same number. So that's another interesting thing that happens on this particular limit. All right, let me uh, grab all this and just kind of shrink it a little because I need some more space. So when I write my integral, it's going to look like this, right? And our, uh, if you don't mind, we're going to just do a radius. Why don't we just do a radius um, 2, a radius a 1 a hemisphere, right? Or let's do a radius 2. We'll do a radius 2 hemisphere, right? And we're not doing the bottom right now, remember? We're not doing the bottom right now. Okay, so that would mean we're integrating our bands from y equals 0 to y equals 2. Right, so that's, I wanted to know that because I wanted to put that on here. And then we're going to write, um, we're going to write the, you know, integrand. This pi is just going to be there, it's just there to stay. The uh, r plus r is going to become 2r. And so what's happening there is your, and I already said this, but the little r on top and the big R on the bottom get smushed. When this thing gets smushed this way, they collapse onto the same number. So little r becomes big R. And that means this is going to become little r plus little r. Or you could say big R plus big R. So that's a little bit of a shocking feature. But this becomes a two little r. Or you could put two big R. Doesn't matter. And um, then times the h. So times the h means you're going to include that red bit now. Uh, one of these, I suggest the second one because it looks more like what we're doing. And these become, as you know, differentials. That is the answer. And uh, one more thing, what is this r right here? Because you can't have that in your integral. Period three, part one. And part two will be like 10 minutes instead of 30. So this will be part one. Check out the next video, period three.